Welcome to the Copeland Coaching Podcast, where it's all about turning your job search into a slam dunk. Your host is Angela Copeland. Welcome to the Copeland Coaching Podcast. I'm your host, Angela Copeland. Live on the phone with me today, I have Lizzie Post and Daniel Post Senning from the Emily Post Institute in Burlington, Vermont. Lizzie and Dan co host a great podcast called Awesome Etiquette, where they guide listeners through everything from traditional etiquette quandaries to newly emerging issues in the modern world. They've also written a number of great etiquette books, including The Etiquette Advantage in Business, which is a guide for professionals on navigating everyday and unusual situations in the office. Another amazing book they've helped to write is Emily Post's Etiquette, and actually, I've had a copy of that book in my office for over 10 years, so I'm very excited to talk with Lizzie and Dan today. Lizzie and Dan, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having us. Angela, it really is a pleasure. Well, I'm so excited. I think I mentioned um, just before we got started that I really do enjoy your podcast. I listen every week, so I think the listeners today will get a lot of great information that will be very helpful in their job search. Oh, good. Well, we hope we always hope we can be of help. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I think the place I'd like to start in terms of first is first impressions. And so often when we meet someone new, they really size us up and kind of make a decision about us in a matter of moments. Can you talk a little bit about how to sort of make the best first impression in those first few moments? Absolutely. Yeah, it's, you know, the first impression really has so much to do with that handshake, making eye contact. We say kind of the four steps to a great introduction are that you make eye contact, that you you make sure that you are standing when you're greeting the person. It definitely levels the playing field and shows a sign of respect. Um, It also makes it easier to make that eye contact at at closer eye level, depending on what height you are. Um, You really want to smile. Smiling is a huge part of introductions. And, you know, you don't have to have a big, goofy smile and get all giddy, but you do want to be welcoming and inviting and show that you're happy to be there. And then, of course, you want that wonderful handshake. And uh, you want to be careful not to have a bone-crushing handshake where the person leaves, you know, feeling ouch or, you know, needs a brace for the next week. And you also want to watch out for that limp, dead fish handshake that seems so sort of insincere. So we always say crook of the thumb to crook of the thumb, a nice, firm but gentle grip, and then three shakes up and down, sometimes only two and then disengage. You don't want to put your arm on the other person's arm or shoulder, or you don't want to pull that scene in Ally McBeal where, where they only reach out less than halfway to show that the other person has to cross more territory. <laughs> it's a lot of power play. <laughs> um, but I think that that's really one of the very first things you can do, other than, of course, be on time. In fact, if it's a job interview, you want to show up just a little bit early. Oh, that's great advice. I, I think absolutely, especially the be on time, because when you show up late, you've sort of gotten off to the wrong foot just immediately. You have to start off with an apology. It's the worst way. And I, so sorry. By the way, my name is. <laughs> oh, terrible, terrible. This sounds awful. <laughs> I, I tell you, all the cliches about first meetings are so true, and they're, they're, they're cliches because we say them all the time <laughs> because they're true, and you don't get a second chance to make a first impression, and they are critical. They can make or break you. Um, and you started off by, by sort of alluding to that, that so many judgments are made in those first couple of moments when you meet somebody. And the, the bad news is a lot of those judgments have to do with things we don't have a lot of control of. How tall you are, how symmetrical your face is, <laughs> how fast your irises dilate in response to emotional cues. But the way you introduce yourself, like Lizzie says, the way you choose to present yourself with a good introduction, a smile, a handshake, really sets the tone for, for that whole relationship. But it's, it's your chance to seize control of that moment. And um, it, it, you can't overstress the importance of that and really engaging with that moment and, and, and seizing it. Right. I, I totally agree. And I do think a lot of what we're judged on are things that we don't have control over and they're things that may or may not be fair. Um, most likely not fair. <laughs> right. But, you know, you have to control as much as you can. I know you can't see me, but with heels on, I'm over six feet tall. And so when I go to job interviews, I often get comments about my size. <laughs> uh. And, you know, it's typically positive, but it makes me realize how much people really are kind of sizing you up in those initial, you know, moments. 
Absolutely. They, they can't help it. It's natural. And, we all do it. And if you're yeah. unsure at all, if maybe you don't have a great handshake or what your introduction is like, we always say practice with a friend or family member. Practice with people. Um, that way you can get feedback from someone who you know will give you an honest answer and you can say, hey, man, this is going to seem silly, but I need to practice this because I want to get this right. Absolutely. And, you know, the clients that I ask to practice with me the most actually are typically are clients who maybe have moved to the U.S. from another part of the world. And maybe the tradition seems to be a little different. And, you know, I want them to feel really comfortable doing sort of the the handshake that is expected here so that it's not um, startling to the interviewer. It's not noticeable. Yeah, I agree. When, when all those factors are working for you, that the attention really stays on you and the quality of your work and what you bring to the situation. The last thing you want distracting from that is a uh, a too soft handshake. Yes. So I have one last question about um, handshakes in particular. Occasionally, you know, someone will reach out and shake hands with two hands. Um, they kind of grasp your hand on the other side as well. When is that appropriate and when is that not appropriate? Never appropriate in business. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's such that's a good answer. That's one of those answer. easy yeah. rules that this is not appropriate in business. It's a, it's a sign. It's, it's weird. It both crosses into territory that you see happen when someone is getting, like, consoled. Um, you can often see, see you know, um, if you're setting up a funeral, a priest will often reach out or, or, or a religious officiant will reach out with both hands. And it's a very consoling nature. It also can be a power struggle thing. I'm, I've got you on both sides. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm bigger than you. I'm better than you. I'm, I'm taking control. And both times it's just inappropriate in the business sense, especially for a job interview. But in some social circumstances, maybe you want that affectionate second hand. Or, right, or the, the hand, the pat on the back with the handshake. But in business, yeah, you don't want to confuse the moment. Um, and the, the standard handshake is just one hand, and uh, the best thing you can do is keep that second hand out of the equation. Yes. I love that. You know, living in the South, uh, I think the second hand probably comes in more often than maybe it should. <laughs> I can picture that. So I really, I really appreciate that. I love watching politicians meet at they the center of the stage the and, and race that you can grab the other's elbow first. It's yeah, just so terrible. <laughs> um, but it does illustrate how some people really do perceive it as a controlling gesture or a gesture of dominance also. Yeah, so it's like you that want to be careful about the signals you're sending. You're under my wing. Like, I've got you, son. It's like, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, another way that people really, you know, judge you pretty quickly besides just these mannerisms is what you're wearing. You know, what do you recommend that a candidate wear to a job interview and how is that different than what you might recommend that they wear to work every day? Sure. Our our standard line for recommendations around job interviews is you want to dress one notch up. You want to take some pride in your appearance and make an effort. So what does that mean? In different circumstances, it's going to mean different things. The, the standards for dress and attire vary widely from industry to industry or even um, at company different levels company. within an industry or even company to company. Um, so there are a lot of fashion choices that you can make, but whatever choices you do choose, we say that you really want to take pride in your appearance. You want to make an effort. You want to present as someone who's neat and clean, someone who's well taken care of and takes pride in their appearance. And, and that will be communicated. Um, you, don't want to, you don't want to stray into territory that's, that's too extreme. You don't want to, to shoot for the moon and overdo it um, or step out of your comfort zone. But I, I do tell people it's, it's okay to, to, to do more than you would on a regular day. And you want to think about the person that's going to be interviewing you and at least match their level of formality or dress. So if you have a question about that, you can call ahead and ask. If there's any question about what the standards are, it's entirely appropriate to, to call and figure that out. And, and that might be um, the person who's setting up the interview for you. It might be an admin at the, at the office that you're going to be interviewing at. It might even be um, asking the person who's going to be interviewing you what, they, what, what they're used to for an interview or how you should approach it, and, and they'll tell you. Or just what the company is, finding out what the company's culture is like um, and finding out what their dress code is is a great place to start because then you know what notch up you can go for. If this is a, a jeans and 
and, you know, polo shirt or loose button-down shirt kind of a place, then putting on a, a jacket and a button-down is probably great. You probably don't need the tie. You could put the tie on for an extra notch-up. But um, you, can, you can sort of play with it that way. Um, and a lot of people worry, oh, well, if I'm calling in, what if I hit the person who is going to sabotage me because they don't want the new person? It's so rare that that happens. Don't, don't worry about that. Trust whatever the person says. You know, and if it ever gets called into question, you said, you know, I tried to do the right thing and call the head and... Whoops, what I heard. And the nice thing is, is that if you are, if you do do a jacket and tie and a nice shirt, you can always take the tie off if you get there and you feel that it's just a little too much. That's great advice. And I think especially, you know, checking ahead and, and kind of getting a sense for what's best in that environment is really important because um, I know with a lot of the clients I work with, they're looking to switch industries completely. And so sure. I've heard stories where, you know, people have shown up and been overdressed or vice versa have been really underdressed. Um, you know, I went to graduate school in Los Angeles, and one of my classmates went to the East Coast for an interview. Uh, I know how this is going to go. Right? <laughs> A few years ago. And, um, you know, he's a management-level person, and he showed up in jeans. Yeah. D- didn't think anything of it. This person has an MBA from a great school. And um, they were absolutely shocked at the interview. They could not get over it. And you know, he really had no chance at getting that job. It can be an absolute deal breaker. And and as you point out, it, it can go either way. But um, it's it's definitely worth paying attention. It shows respect to the people that you're going to be working with to, to pay attention to how people dress. And, and um, it can seem like that's just an external marker. What really matters is what's inside. Well, in, in some cases, what matters is what you do on the outside. And particularly when you're when you're going to a job interview, you're making that first impression. You're just building the relationship. Showing someone that you care is a really good idea. So we we really do say make the effort and and remember too that it's not just it's not just putting on the jacket. It's putting on the jacket that's pressed. It's not just you know, putting on the shirt. It's making sure it doesn't have any stains or wear marks. You know, I mean, guys, right around the collar, it's really easy for those threads to start to come undone a little bit, show a little sign of wear. Um, you know, ladies, if you do choose to wear pantyhose or tights, you know, no runs. You can't, you know, there's there's a lot that it's not just about putting on the right clothes, but it is about making sure that you smell clean and fresh and that you don't put on a perfume or a cologne that's overwhelming. You know, it's about making sure, guys, that beard, if you keep facial hair, and even if you keep stubble, that it's, it's cleaned up, it looks wow. nice, you know. It's, it's thinking about those little things because you don't want in an interview for someone to be distracted. I mean, if... I hate to say it, but even ladies, things to think about is your own facial hair. We have it. you got to take <laughs> care of it. Get a good girlfriend to say, is there something going on? <laughs> you know, because you don't want someone staring at your face and not listening to the great work and accomplishments that you're bringing to the table, but instead be focusing on that stray hair, that, you know, torn collar, that, you know, fly away, the sticking up like alfalfa from the rat little rascals, you know. You want to really make sure that the that everything else is so in line that all they can focus on is who you are and what you do and how well you do it. I totally agree. And I think, too, when I go through interviews, you know, I pay attention to see if there are certain things that people comment on. Like with me, yeah. I have I have long hair and I look particularly – I look younger than my age, uh, fortunately. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> but – you know, I get a lot of comments about my hair. And so when I go into interviews, I'm very careful that I pull my hair back. I put it in, you know, usually a bun or some other kind of style where my hair is not a distraction. Like we're not, I'm not, I'm not going there to discuss my hair. I'm, I'm going there to have an interview. Right, right. That's absolutely, absolutely the right way to think about it. Right. And so I just think if you start to notice a pattern, <laughs> you know, uh, there's something that's coming up that's unrelated. It could be with your clothes. It could be in some other area. You know, if, it, if it's coming up, it's unrelated. It seems distracting and maybe not in the most positive way. I, I would really take note of that. 
Absolutely. I bet your friend with the jeans, I bet none of the people who interviewed them, him could tell what school he went to or what his previous job was, but they remember the jeans. Absolutely. They absolutely remember the jeans. <laughs> you know, and I know on the, the other side of the spectrum, with me, I started working in corporate when I was 19. So, whoa. Right. And so when I. Right. right. <laughs> So when I go into job interviews, I often come across probably very corporate. And um, when I've ever interviewed at like an advertising agency, for example, it can tend to kind of put them off because I just come across too corporate and they're so much more creative. So when I when I go into that environment, I have to dress down and really try to think of like, how can I look a little bit more hip in this environment? <laughs> Totally. Well, you're, you're talking to two people in Burlington, Vermont. Right. For our casual work culture. It's, it's I, pretty amazing when you get on a flight from here down to New York City. Yeah, <laughs> I am definitely wearing my muck boots to work because it's muddy <laughs> outside. <laughs> it happens. Absolutely. We don't have any visitors. <laughs> right, which that's amazing. <laughs> Um, so another thing I know a lot of my clients tend to struggle with is small talk. And this is especially an issue for people who may be introverted or who it's really important that they are very authentic in their conversations. And, you know, a lot of times when you're in an interview, small talk is something that happens. It, it needs to happen. Can you talk a little bit about why it is important and what you would suggest for someone who really struggles in the area of small talk? So Dan's actually got three three tiers that um, he's going to talk about in just a minute. But to to ask to answer directly your question about for people that struggle in small talk, small talk there's there's two secrets to making it really really easy, and the first is actually going to be one of Dan's tiers where you want to just think about really easy safe topics to connect on. Now remember, sometimes you're going to talk toss these topics out there. And you won't get, you'll get the silence because you say, hey, did you see that movie? Well, they didn't, so you can't discuss it. But use it as a way to lead into a question about the person. Oh, if you didn't catch it, well, what do you like to watch? And not any time that this is the secret to small talk is asking people about themselves. Ask questions. Um, I, I know that, you know, Dan and I each go around the country. We have to engage in small talk. We actually both like engaging in small talk. We are those people who don't just plug in at the, at the airport. We'll talk to the person next to us or on that flight. And it's so easy for both of us because we're not afraid to ask questions. And it really does make a difference. I also say practice small talk all that you can. Use as many opportunities as you can to practice it when it's not sort of um, a high-stakes moment for you. So when you go to a family gathering, just chat it up a little bit more with your family. When you're at a friend's house for dinner, be a little bit more talkative. And that doesn't mean talking about yourself. It means asking people about themselves. And now I'm turning it over to Dan because these three tiers, let me tell you, you are going to ace small talk if you do these. Oh, great. I, I tell you, I, I love I love thinking about conversation and conversation concepts. Although just listening to Lizzie right now talk, I'm also reminded that listening is such a key conversation skill Huge that it, it really it. pairs with that that ability to ask questions, but then attentively listen, so that you're playing both roles in the conversation. Um, it is really critically important, and it can be really easy to focus on the "what do I say" part, and that. That, that asking questions and listening is such an important other side of the coin. But when we think about what, what, it, what is okay to talk about, I, I'm reminded of my mother who told me to cultivate a curiosity about the world and that if, that, uh, if you're interested in the world, you will be a more interesting person. Yeah. And the, the, the safe topics that I encourage people to start to de- develop a few um, simple things that they have to say about them, the sport, sports, the weather, celebrities or pop culture, or even just what you had for breakfast that morning. So pop culture or entertainment, that's common, that's shared by people, is oftentimes a great thing to talk about. Sports, another great thing to talk about. Arts, if you're into arts or entertainment. Um, Music, movies, books, anything. Read the headlines on a favorite blog, listen to a podcast about current events, Read the headlines on a newspaper. That's a little antiquated at this stage, but <laughs> cultivate a curiosity about your world. It really is going to serve you. And 
so we're, we're already starting to talk about the, the other thing I'm going to say is you got to know what not to talk about. And tier two of a conversation, my, in my family we used to call it not table talk, NTT. You didn't talk about sex, religion, or politics in, in mixed or polite company. And the idea was that people have really strong and really different opinions about those topics. So you're going to save them. You know, it might be your favorite thing to talk about whatever the, the hot political issue of the day is but you're not going to do it at the job interview. You're going to stay out of that tier two of the conversation. You're going to stay away from your love life. You're going to stay away from uh, your religion, or uh, you're going to stay away from politics. And then tier three of a conversation is the most personal, the most intimate, the little mnemonic for remembering it is family and finance, FF. And you're not going to talk about anything family or finance unless you've really established rapport in a relationship and you know you have standing to have that conversation. So you're not going to tell stories about your immediate family. You're not going to talk about health issues. You're also not going to talk about how much you paid for your last home or apartment or when you were last foreclosed on. You're just going to leave discussions about finances and close family matters completely off the table unless you've got a, a standing relationship with someone where you've got standing to talk about those things. And there aren't those other people around that you don't have standing. So the mixed okay. company thing, just because, I mean, Dan and I are family. We pretty much know just about everything about each other. But when there are other people at the table, we won't go to those subjects because it's mixed company. Even though family is present, non-family is present too. So you really want to stay in that tier one, those the, that safe topics for small talk, and then you want to ask questions and listen, and you're going to be in great shape. And as sports nuts, we're both very excited that sports is in tier one because it's always <laughs> the place to go to. Absolutely. Well, these are fantastic suggestions. I think they're helpful both for people who may feel shy and are kind of not sure where to begin. But I think also I actually talk about this issue a lot with my clients because living, again, living in the South, um, religion is a very common topic of discussion here. And I think a lot of people assume that other people may think the way that they think. Um, And so I think it's really important for them to be aware going into an interview it, you don't know the other person. You know, they may have a view that's really different than yours, and you don't want to not get a job because you don't share an opinion on something that's kind of not relevant to that job. Right. And it's, it, it, it is dangerous territory when someone, you're right, they say something that would imply that you are in the same camp or, or, or thought that they're having or, or kind of on their side. And it's really good to have a few deflectors Mm -hmm. in your back pocket. Um, You know, finding soft ways to get out of a conversation is an extremely, um, it's it's an art. Uh, (laughs) And it's one that you do have to go on carefully. Um, And in a job interview, you want to be especially careful because you don't want to say that's not, you don't want to tell the interviewer they're being inappropriate by assuming this. Um, and you also don't want to go straight for the, let's ad- agree to disagree. Mm-hmm. And it's one of those where my favorite place to go for it is, well, that's definitely a conversation for the future. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's like, <laughs> and if, I, if I, if I, that's when you get to like, if I get this job, I would love to discuss that over lunch, you know, and that way you can let them know that this is not the time that you want to get into it or that you're going to share your opinion, but you're capable. Yeah, you're capable, you understand, and you would love to engage at a different point. Whether or not you actually ever engage if you get that job is totally beyond. But you haven't revealed anything about yourself, you haven't criticized anything about them, and you're, you're kind of bringing the focus back to let's remember where we are without actually having to say let's remember that we're strangers. <laughs> no, that's a fantastic point. And that actually really leads in well to my next question, which is around those really awkward moments that seem to come up during interviews. Um, for example, I know at a recent interview, oh. I was asked if I have children, if I'm married, or if I plan to have any children anytime soon. <laughs> and okay. um, wildly inappropriate. Yeah, it's, uh, in fact, illegal. Right. Um, again, <laughs> you don't want to say that to somebody. Um, I personally, I we have language in our business etiquette book that's a bit stronger than I would even feel comfortable using. But I think people should feel confident using it if they would like to. 
Um, my my go to for that kind of a thing um, would be, you know, at this moment I'm undecided, or at this moment that's that's not something I'm comfortable sharing. Um, but it's even even the I'm not comfortable sharing uh, is is territory that you might be advised not to go into. But I think just leaving it with I'm undecided or that's something I haven't quite you know decided for myself yet. It at least allows you to have said something to let people know it's something you're thinking of and that you're aware of based on your age and and maybe your marital status or maybe you know just your your place in life. So there's something Lizzie's doing here that I think is really wise, and I'd be curious your thoughts on this. Going around also. things, I feel like I'm not <laughs> giving a straight answer. <laughs> no, and, but what I'm hearing is that you're you're addressing the question, but not necessarily questioning the questioner. Right. So you can say, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if that question's relevant. Um, I'm not sure if I'm comfortable answering that question. You're not questioning I their... I can give you a... Uh, well, if you, if you and, say... And you could say, I'm not comfortable answering that, or I'm, I'm, I'm curious how that's relevant to the job. Or, if, you say the, if you say, I'm not sure how that's relevant to the job, that is questioning the question. Yeah. That's a direct... That's actually yeah. very directly questioning the question. But you should also know it's not out of the realm for you to do that kind of a thing. Sometimes um, interviews can get to that place. Dan and I were talking about this just yesterday. Interviews can get to that place where maybe you're hitting it off with this person and you're connecting with them, and the conversation does start to stray into some of those illegal question territories, which they are actually, you, have, you are protected um, by law from having to answer these questions. And it, it can happen very naturally that it goes there, so it's not intentional. And I think it's very, um, it, it's it's very good to recognize that that unintentional part might be there mm-hmm. by mm-hmm. saying something like, you know, I haven't decided that for myself yet. Something like that, or I'm not sure I'm comfortable talking about that just yet with you. But if things pr- progress further, you know, right. Uh, uh, I'm curious, Angela. What, what, how did you handle it? Yeah, I am very curious. <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's... We're at the family business. We don't have to answer those questions that much. <laughs> Most people know what we think. Yeah. Right. You know, it's a good question. I think it really depends on, you know, how much you really want to land this job. You know, in some cases, you may want to sort of stick up for yourself, and maybe you've decided, hey, this is maybe not where I want to work anyway. Right. Um, but I think if you really are trying to get that job offer, um, it is important to not necessarily question the questioner. Um, one response I've heard, which I've never used, which I, I think is kind of interesting, is you know, if asked the question, like, are you planning to have more children, something where you kind of skate through it in an almost snappy way where you say, you know, I haven't decided, but either way, I'm just a fantastic hard worker and you know, I'm I'm so excited about this opportunity. You know, and not and then back to safe territory, and and definitely back to the focus where it should be, which is on your skills. Right. Exactly. Exactly. You know, when I was asked these questions about, you know, are you married? Do you have children? I think in the most recent situation, I just answered them because I thought, you know, I don't even, I I don't want this to even be a blip. I just want to answer it and keep going. Um, but, you know, in the back of my mind, I thought, you know, I don't think I want to work for this person. <laughs> um, right. And it's always surprising to me that interviewers ask these questions because I've actually seen them a number of times. Um, I think the issue, my guess, is that the issue is I think companies assume that we know what is illegal to ask and what is not. And many big corporations don't actually take the time to train their hiring managers on what you should and should not be asking. And and I, I kind of think that's where the gap is. Uh-huh. My sister, when we, we recently posted, actually, we recently posted a job application on LinkedIn um, or a request for applications, and about eight months ago in July, right, June, we had also done it. And it was, my sister is very diligent, and I'm very grateful for that because she really made sure that we, we did look up what's okay to ask, what crosses into territory of mm-hmm. potentially not okay to ask, and then what's completely okay to ask so that all of us interviewing were really on the same page as to what we could ask this interviewee. And it was, I tell you, but, but what was so good about that exercise was how, how natural curiosity 
very easily oh would lead God, you yeah. to places that you wouldn't want to be, which mm-hmm. I think really speaks to the point you're making, that without really careful training, you're likely to encounter some of this <laughs> at some point. Mm-hmm. And I think, too, as the person being interviewed, the thing to remember is that you don't know exactly how the person will judge you on your answer. Like, right. you know, when I was 20, uh, when I would say, oh, I'm single, yeah, I have no children, I think it— and, I think employers probably looked at that as a positive thing because I was available to work super hard and long hours. And what I have heard from employers now is that when you're in your 30s, as you approach your 40s, if you are unmarried with no children, they look at you almost like a flight risk. Like you have too much freedom. You're not very well grounded. Um, I've, I've actually had a couple of close friends who are hiring managers tell me, I will not hire someone who is single because I want someone who has a family that's going to relocate, that's going to buy a house, and that is going to be rooted here. Um, You know, when I've hired single people, they just can move whenever they want. I've heard people talk about families being a plus because they they, they know they have a responsibility to bring home a paycheck for not just themselves, but for two or three other people. Um, and I think that that, that's something that, you know, it it all depends. If you've got a job that's high in travel, they're often going to be looking for people who are single and don't mind getting up and leaving. You know, they're not going to want the person like me who's so attached to their dog that they don't want (laughs) to leave, you know, and they don't want the person who's got kids and they're really going to start to feel that tug between home life and work life. Um, so it, it does, it depends on the industry. But it's, it's an do, interesting conundrum. And you do just never know <laughs> that the people have strong and different opinions about things. Yeah. And what what's uh you know, one what one, one man's fat it's another man's lean or mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Trash and treasure. Yeah. Right. Well, another area where I think, you know, people seem to really have different opinions and react very differently is sort of in the online space, because that has just evolved so much over the past, you know, 15 or 20 years. Um, Dan, I know you're the author of a book called Emily Post Post's Manners in a Digital World, Living Well Online. And I'd love to kind of get a little bit of um, your thoughts on sort of how the internet is changing, how we communicate with each other, and, um, you know, what we should be keeping in mind. I I love the question. One of the things that's really fun about working at the Emily Post Institute is that the the business really started in 1922 when Emily Post wrote her first book of etiquette. So we've been doing this for almost 100 years now. And one thing that, that is pretty clear is that manners continue to change and evolve. And some manners change more quickly than others. Uh, Our manners around tables, around dining, change very slowly. But manners around communication change really fast. As the communication environment changes, um, a lot of the specific expectations that we have of each other in relation to, to that communication environment change. And they change more quickly than other manners. So I think oftentimes people feel... Like, that's a a place where they're not as sure what the expectations are. And we've definitely noticed that that although it's true that the specific expectations change, that there are some real standards that stay the same, no matter what medium people are communicating in. Um, And that's, for for me, the real golden rule is that the relationship stays primary, that the communication, whatever it is that's happening, is happening in service of the relationship. And as long as people take the time to think and think about the relationship and the person involved in the communication, most of the time they know what to do. Most of the time people can figure out what's a reasonable social expectation if they just slow down long enough to think about the people that are affected. And that's sort of that's the good news, bad news, because um, it is a tricky new environment where social norms are changing and evolving all the time. Um, and it puts a lot of responsibility on each individual to pay attention to what they're doing. Um, at the same time, that responsibility is also also an honor and a privilege because it, it, it does put you in control, and there are real opportunities for distinction in that Wild West uh, territory of the online world where the social standards aren't always as clear. Um, people who really show respect and take care with the relationships that they're that they're supporting in those mediums really shine and stand out. I I couldn't agree more. You know, I think um, sometimes when we move between the mediums, we, especially online, we can sometimes lose sight of, um, we may become more harsh or it's, 
it feels less personal. So I think sometimes we say things that, that we might not say in other other places. Sure. Well, you, the, 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 um, my Uncle Peter, Lizzie's father, talks about the electronic brick wall. Louis C.K. has that great bit he did on, on, on Late Night where he talks about the, the kids these days. They used to pick on each other, and you'd see it made someone sorry when you picked on them. And now you pick on them via text, and you don't see that it hurts their feelings, so it doesn't make you feel sorry. Yeah. And that, that electronic brick wall that removes you potentially from, from the immediate consequences of your actions, the immediate social repercussions. Um, it can definitely make it harder to assess the, the impact of those messages. And um, definitely that, that tendency towards harshness when, in the absence of other information, oftentimes our, our interpretation defaults to the negative as people. So if you write something that sounds to you very neutral in tone, someone else might read it as negative. If you write something that sounds very positive in tone to you, someone else might read it as neutral. They don't have that little twinkle in your eye or or tick on the corner of your lip to show that you're smiling when you say it. Um, so we tell people in written communication, you really have to, to take that extra step, go that extra mile to make explicit what your tone is. And uh, the advent of emoticons, <laughs> which unfortunately aren't appropriate in business. So, <laughs> but, but, but can be effective in the use. They're very effective, except for when they turn into J's when they yeah. go. Between. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Although what what I will tell you that the, the original emoticon is the the magic words they take communication and they really change the tone. Yes. And if you can remember your magic words, please, thank you, you're welcome. Excuse me. I'm Excuse sorry. me. Pardon me. These words will transform your communication, and they're they're just as useful online as they are in person. Absolutely, I totally agree. I think the other thing too that we should all kind of be aware of is that different people have a different comfort level with different types of communication. Um, you know, I've noticed, especially with my clients who are younger, they're much more comfortable texting versus maybe my clients who are a bit older um, or who may be working in a more traditional industry, they're much more comfortable on the phone um, or in email. And so I think, you know, we just can't assume that the other person is going to have the same comfort level with different types of technology as, as we do. I think that's really savvy. We, we oftentimes say that the medium is part of the message, and you really want to think about who it is you're communicating with, and you want to make choices that make it easy for that other person. One of um, Emily's original tenets of good etiquette is that, that it's based on the ability to put others at ease, to make other people feel comfortable. So uh, an aging grandparent probably an email is not the best way to, to reach them. Um, and then the same is true with a millennial. Maybe maybe a text is the best way to get in touch with your teenage son or daughter. Um, and meeting them in the medium that they're most comfortable in is, is, is an important part of having good communication. Absolutely. And I think, too, you know, say if you're a millennial and you're interviewing for a job, you should definitely be conscious of the fact that something like texting the interviewer is most likely not appropriate. Um, you know, you need to keep it to sort right. of more old-fashioned methods of communication and not sort of stray over into that sort of um, casual territory during an interview process. I, I want to affirm that for you a thousand times. <laughs> we do a lot of speaking at, at colleges and for new hire programs, and, and this is something I've heard quite a bit about, particularly some of the business schools I've worked at, where they're sending their their highest potential students to high-end contacts in industry, then those students aren't um, aren't handling their communication duties responsibly, are either texting or are responding with emails that aren't formatted properly, emails that look like texts that aren't written in complete sentences or even structured like little letters. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that was reason enough for a, a certain business school to bring in the Emily Post Institute to do a training. Oh, I think that's so smart. You know, part of my practice is that I, I connect a lot of my clients to contacts I have in industry. And I'll do kind of a virtual introduction, and then I'll ask them, ask the client to set up a time to meet with the person. And, of course, the person has already agreed in advance, you know, to meet them. But occasionally I will do that, and the client will respond in a way that I'm, I'm, I'm horrified, you know. And it's someone who's so smart and really well-spoken and 
it just, the train goes off the tracks and we kind of have to talk about it. So I've started being more clear as well in my direction just to be sure that, you know, we're all on the same page um, so that those contacts are really positive and that, you know, when you're reaching out in industry, you have the best possible chance of making a great impression. Yeah, no, and then last thing you want to do is blow that first impression before you even meet them. Oh, I know, yeah. <laughs> it's also hard because I think it also damages your connection to the person who introduced you um, because you've possibly embarrassed them or, you know, brought their judgment into question of why would they introduce you in the first place. And so That's another really good point, yeah. Yeah, they might not want to introduce you in the future if, if they see that you're not able to kind of navigate these types of situations. So the next step, I guess, from going from the digital world is going to sort of paper, (laughs) which is a world that's really foreign to me, honestly. Um, But can you talk a little bit about what are your thoughts on traditional thank you notes, paper notes that you actually write um, to the interviewer after the interview? So there's two things you want to think about when it comes to thank you notes and, and the interview process. And the first is that um, no matter what, a well-written thank you note, handwritten thank you note, is going to make a good impression. It will often stay on someone's desk or in their drawer. Um, I know I have some that are years old. Some people have them. Yeah, Dan's opening his drawer right now, and it's like full of them. Absolutely um, bust out. So one of the things to think about is that it's a great way to be remembered. However, in the interview world, speed is also of the essence. So we say, um, we we always phrase it as thank them twice, but I actually think you thank them three times. You thank them at the end of the interview. Thank you so much for spending the time and taking the time. Um, And then you, I have, we've always encouraged people to write that email thank you quickly and to, to get it sent out within 24 hours of the interview. Um, and then, you know, a note, a follow-up note is always a good option as well. But you do kind of want to think about the industry that you're in. Um, you do want to think about, you know, how fast they're moving through the interview process if you know that they are trying to hire someone very quickly. Um, those are things to take into account. But no matter what, a hand, excuse me, a handwritten note will always be something that will get noticed. It also shows that you have the skill to do it that this is something that's important to you, that there's a good chance that if you're hired, you will be sending things like this to clients and and, um, people that you work with and cementing that good business relationship. Absolutely. I think often, too, when you send that handwritten thank you note, you're many times the only candidate who sent one. (laughs) Absolutely. It's such a differentiator. Even at the Emily Post Institute, we interview for internships, and I'll be surprised. It's, it's on the checklist of things to do at an interview when, if, if you were to look on our website before you came in. And, and still we get them from about a third of the applicants. And it, it's oh. not going to guarantee you the position, but if it's you and someone else, it, it absolutely differentiates you. Wow. One of my, my favorite little tips, too, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of leave, leave thank you notes with this thought where the medium is part of the message and they do still matter. Sending a thank you note for an Someone who's interview- sending a thank you note to someone who's interviewed you for a job that you don't end up getting is yes. another thing that I really recommend. Yes. Thanking someone for taking the time to interview you. It's not just about thanking them for giving you the job. Yes. And there's almost no better test of someone's um, etiquette or, or social behavior than when they're faced with a challenge or a difficult situation. And when you're performing with grace and poise, when you don't get the job. I think that speaks as highly of you as anything. So so really investing in that thank you note as a way to cultivate gratitude in yourself and build relationships, not just to thank people for things that um that were good that happened to you, I think is a really good practice and a good way to approach the thank you note as an opportunity. Oh, I think that's such great advice. And I, I, I love that because so often when you don't get the job, it does feel very personal. And so many people just want to walk away. Um, yeah. But I can personally say years ago, I think it was 2005 or something, I had an interview for a job, and I did not get the job, and I wrote a thank you note, I think, and I stayed in touch with the person who I did not know before that. And about a year and a half or two years later, he asked me um, to go and have a coffee, 
And, you know, he was the vice president of digital marketing at this big company here in Memphis. And I went and I was nervous. Um, I'm not sure why we're having coffee. (laughs) And we sat down and he said, I have a job open. Would you like to come and work for me? And I didn't know the job was open. I did not apply. And he was like, can you start next week? (laughs) So I I think there's absolutely value there. You're really, I look at interviews as, first of all, practice. If it doesn't work out, it's practice for the next one. And it's also an opportunity to build a relationship. Um, You know, jobs can get put on hold. The hiring manager can be transitioned to another area. A lot of things can happen outside of your control. But if you take the time to build the relationship in the future, there may be something there. Absolutely. You just don't know that the next candidate might be an absolute genius. Right. <laughs> you might be great, but there might be someone who's just even better, and that's, that has nothing to do with you. Right. Right. Well, I just have one last question, and that is, um, you know, in a couple of my recent podcasts, we've talked about this topic of hidden rules at work. And I think it's especially important when you're kind of moving into an area that's really different than where you're used to working or when you're being promoted to a higher and higher level within an organization. Are there any tips that you might give us to keep in mind about sort of these hidden rules that are under the surface that we might not know about? Uh, the, the very nature of, of something like a hidden rule makes makes it kind of tricky. Um, so the best advice that I can give someone who feels who can feel the the social dynamic changing around them as they move through the ranks in an organization is to stay really intentional and stay really aware. Watch the people around you. Look for allies, people that you can talk to. Ask questions about what, what's expected. Um, don't be shy about asking questions. There's a, a perception that, that, that etiquette or, or, or knowing these hidden rules is about keeping people out, and it's really not the case. People who have good etiquette, people who are part of clubs that you want to be a part of, aren't, aren't going to make an effort to exclude you for arbitrary reasons. Um, if there is a code of conduct that you need to decipher, it's probably there because it's functioning for that group in some way and figuring out what those social norms are so that you can be a, a good functioning member of that group is, is part of your job as you move through an organization or as you climb through the ranks. But it's, I, I don't think anyone should feel scared about it or feel um, it's, it's a natural process and it's, it's, it's not in place to keep you out. Like any social codes that you find yourself joining are, are probably there to, to serve the group that's using them in some way. So it's just a matter of finding the keys and, and getting in the door. The other thing I would suggest, Angela, is um, be the helper. Be the person who lets the new guy know, hey, that breakfast tray is actually set out because on Thursdays we always meet with one client and it's actually for them for that meeting. Um, you know, it, the, the hidden rules are as, as simple as that and as complicated as, um, I don't know, you know, you know, just as complicated as you could imagine, I guess would be the best way to say it. But be that person who, who you want to be careful about crossing into the territory of gossip, but without crossing into that territory of gossip, um, queuing a new guy in or queuing someone who's just been promoted to your level in on a few things that kind of um, your team or, or your floor has uh, adhered to over the years that maybe someone coming in just wouldn't pick up on is a really nice thing to do. It's a really considerate behavior, um, and it, it is acting in that way that you wish others would, would treat you. Absolutely. I think it's really kind, and I'm sure we've all been in a situation where, you know, we didn't know all of the social rules, and, and having someone, you know, that's willing to be open with you is, is really, a, it's a great thing that they can do. Um, well, thank you both so much. Is We've covered so many topics. Is there any other advice that you'd like to share with our listeners who may be looking for a job before we wrap up? Be on time. That's, I'm just going back <laughs> that. We talk about it's that so, so much, but it's so, it's so necessary. And, you know, really, it's, um, it's also be who you are. Because if you walk into a job interview and you are anyone other than yourself, you are going to have to be that person that you're faking it as for the rest of your job with this company. Um, and I, I know having not been in the hiring position, but just the jobs I even had as a teenager, 
you know, that when someone came on and acted one way in the interview and then turned out to be somebody else, boy, it's a real disappointment. And you want to you want a good fit. You want a job, not just because you you need to make money and you want to be employed and you you want your brain being active in that way, but because you want a good fit. So be who you are. If it's not a good fit, the right thing will come along. Absolutely, absolutely. It's great advice. Well, so for our listeners today who are interested to follow you or uh, reach out and learn more, where sh- where do you recommend that they go? Lizzie and I are, are so pleased to host the Awesome Etiquette Podcast. It's a question and answer etiquette podcast that airs weekly, and you can find it on any major podcast provider under Awesome Etiquette. You can also search iTunes for Lizzie Post or Daniel Post Senning, and it should come up. And you can write in to us at awesomeetiquette at emilypost.com. You can also get more of our information on emilypost.com. And Dan and I are both actively on Twitter, and we love followers, and we love <laughs> retweets and favorites and questions coming in. So please reach out to me at Lizzie A. Post. And I'm at Daniel underscore Post. Excellent. Well, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, I do listen to your podcast every week, and I hope everyone will reach out and, and download it um, on iTunes or wherever they get their podcasts from, because I, I really enjoy it. And thank you both for joining me. Thank, thank you, you so much for having, for having us. Having us. Jinx! <laughs> 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 no, but, Julie, thank you so much for having us. Dan, you go ahead. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, I'll say it a third time. It, re- it really has been a pleasure. Well, thank you. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Tune in next week for another edition of the Copeland Coaching Podcast. And if you haven't already, please be sure to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher to ensure you never miss an episode. Thank you for listening to the Copeland Coaching Podcast today with your host, Angela Copeland. Tune in next time to get more great tips on turning your job search into a slam dunk.